Um, and embrace the glory of Dhamma. May I perfect the qualities of the levels and parts and thus swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara. Okay. Let's just do the four limitless contemplations. Um, May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness, which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion, free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Semchen tamche dewa tang dewe ju tang den pa ju tig, dungal tang dungal chit ju tang tra wa ju tig, Dungal mepe de wa tampa tang mindra wa ju tig, nearing chak tang ni tang tra we tang no chempo la ne pa ju so everybody, it's lovely to see all of you. We'll try and work out with Passovers, Easter's and everything how we can get on with it. But tonight I'm going to do, um, the topic is when neuroses, traumas, scars and stresses seem to overwhelm our spiritual progress. Now this is a massive subject mainly because there's a lot to say about neuroses, traumas, scars, and stresses. And then there's a lot to say how Buddhism gets another approach completely and totally. And when you can get it, then it really, really is so useful to have the practices and to, I know a lot of you do the practices, but a lot of you don't really understand how they actually help the neuroses and the traumas and the scars and all the rest of it that we have. So what I did for this was I took into the bush when I was in the bush about 30 lectures that I'd done on the subject at all different times. And so I was paging through everything. There was hardly ever any time to read anything. But anyway, I was paging through and taking out stuff from everything that I'd done before. And I want to make this really a discussion because what I'm really, really keen to do is to see if I can help with all your own neuroses, your scars, your traumas, your stresses, your everything. If I can really help with my experience of actually dealing with all of that, plus my Buddhist experience, I'm going to really, really be happy to give this over. But what's very important for me is that you apply this to yourselves, that you don't just take this as a teaching that you're listening to, but you actually apply this to yourself and to your own traumas and your own stuff that you carry, your hang-ups, your everything. Because I really want this, if we do it over two or three lectures, I really want it to be something that you can say, wow, I can really use this for me. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a poem, and it's called, He Always Wanted to Explain Things, and it's by an anonymous person who wrote this. So this is what he said in the poem. He always wanted to explain things, but no one cared, so he drew. Sometimes he would draw, and it wasn't anything. He wanted to carve it in stone or write it in the sky. He would lie out on the grass and look up in the sky. And it would be only him in the sky and the things inside of him that needed saying. And it was that, after that, that he drew the picture. It was a beautiful picture. He kept it under his pillow and he would let no one see it. And he would look at it every night and think about it. And when it was dark and his eyes were closed, he could still see it. And it was all of him. And he loved it. When he started school, he brought it with him, not to show anyone, but just to have it with him like a friend. It was funny about school. 
He's setting a square brown desk like all the other square brown desks. And he thought his desk should be red. And his room was a square brown room like all the other rooms. And it was tight and close and stiff. I'm looking at a few of you and thinking this could have been written about you, okay? You were different when you went to school, okay? He hated to hold the pencil and chalk with his arms stiff and his feet flat on the floor stiff. With the teacher watching and watching, the teacher came and spoke to him. She told him to wear a tie like all the other boys. He said he didn't like ties. She said it didn't matter. And after that, they drew, and he drew all yellow, and it was the way he felt about the morning, and it was beautiful. The teacher came and smiled at him and said, what's this? Why don't you draw something like Ken's drawing? Isn't that beautiful? After that, his mother bought him a tie, and he always drew airplanes and rocket ships like everyone else, and he threw the old picture away. And when he lay alone looking at the sky, it was big and blue and all of everything. But he wasn't anymore. He was square inside and brown and his hands were stiff and he was like everyone else. And the things inside, inside him that needed saying didn't need it anymore. It had stopped pushing. It was crushed, stiff, like everything else. Now, that's a beautiful poem who ever wrote it. And obviously, this person, and I always used to think to myself, even with a couple of my grandchildren, and with kids when I worked in a school, you know, and Kerry, Kerry Hartel, there you are, Kerry, you would find that, that I always liked the spunky, different children, you know, who didn't give the, who didn't, I was like that at school, but who didn't give the teachers exactly what they wanted. I die, by the way. But you know what? It was, it's really a very important poem because this is the reason why we are neurotic, traumatized, scarred, and stressed in this world whose values pick us into a hole and a pit. And I think that a lot of the social media are to blame for a lot of the ills of our world and everything. And I think it's really important. So let's do... Um, um, fee, let's do the psychiatric help of Lucy and Charlie Brown, if you could put that one up. So, no, not that one, not that one. Doesn't really matter, we could do that one anyway. But the other one that I'd sent you, the last one that I sent you of Charlie Brown going to get help from Lucy, the psychiatrist. No, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one, thank you. So Lucy's sitting there. Her psychiatric help is um is is for thirty four cents, and the doctor is in. And Charlie Brown says, "You say I'm hopeless." He says, "Would it bother you if I asked for a second opinion?" She goes, "Not at all. You're hopeless." She gives the second opinion, and I'm looking at that in all seriousness because I think it really is a very, very important one. And now you can go to the one before that, the sheep and the wolf. Just to show you, I'm just setting the stage for samsara. So there is the wolf lecturing the sheep who are very excitable. And he says, after I'm elected, I will become a vegetarian. <laughs> so the wolf isn't going to eat any of them. And all the other bulls that we are sprouted before election of all the promises. So after the election, I'm going to become vegetarian. Okay. I just wanted to put that there because it's really, really important to look at that. And we'll look at the other one just now, the pain. So over here, I just want to differentiate between neuroses and traumas because traumas are actually the things you go through. However, as we know in Buddhism, everything we go through is a temporary transient trauma anyway, you know, but neuroses are the things that we make in our mind, whereas traumas are things we actually experienced in our life. However, I wanted to read you this little story that uh, Suraya Das, the monk, wrote about. He said, 
Once in a three-year retreat, his friend asked the great Dajam Rinpoche, who was the head of the Nyingma school, Rinpoche, if everything is like a dream, an illusion, and not what it seems to be, how did all of this mess of samsara suffering and not understanding who we are come about? Rinpoche exclaimed with a chuckle, did it? Did it come about? Okay. That's all he said. Did it come about? Maybe we only think it came about. And maybe it doesn't really come about. And so we have to think about this when we're looking at our things, because I think that story says it a lot. Did it come about? So to set the tone, I want to define two terms first. One is neuroses. Okay, what are neuroses? So the definition of neuroses is a psychological state characterized by excessive anxiety or insecurity. No evidence of neurological or other organic disease, and it's accompanied by defensive or immature behavior. In other words, we create the defenses against something we feel, and they have, there's nothing that can actually be found in physiological changes or inflictions, and then we develop hang-ups about them, and this leads to some very crazy behavior. And that's what neuroses is all about, okay? Remember, neuroses is different to psycho psychotic behavior, neurotic and psychotic, because by the time it becomes psychotic, then the behavior is already changed and the brain is involved in the psychotic behavior. But the neuroses is purely what we create in our minds and how we get to have hangups. And then the other definition, you can ask me as much as you want about this because it's very important that you understand this. Sorry, I'm alone with my dogs and he's got to change his position about 20 times till he gets comfortable. Okay, so the next definition that I want to give is called neurotic fixations. And I always look at Taisitu for this because Taisitu Rinpoche always says neurotic you in the West, you have neurotic fixations. So let's take a definition of that. Neurotic fixations are object relationships. In other words, you relate to something with a very strong attachment to the people or to the things, the thoughts, the feelings, whatever it is, you are fixated on it, generally persisting from childhood into adult life. You don't like things, certain things. You avoid certain people. You avoid certain situations. You get hysterical about certain things. It's really important. And Rob Priest, and I'm going to use a lot of his stuff because he's a psychologist and a very deep Buddhist, and he really gives a lot of stuff. And he defines neurotic fixation as disturbed behavior pattern associated with nervous distress and fixating, clinging to it, going back and back to it over and over again, obsessing about it. Now, this is very important because a lot of people say to me in meditation, well, I was meditating and then this thought came up about this fight I had with someone or about this thing that I feel so strongly about. And then I did the, I did I did my absolute um, shamata and I just let it arise and I let it dissolve. But then, Melanie, two minutes later, I picked it up again and I was thinking about it again. And I keep doing that. That's what a neurotic fixation is really about. Now, what is very, very interesting is for me, I always wonder why it is that Tibetan people and a lot of Eastern people, not so much the modern, in like in modern China and modern Hong Kong and modern Eastern people, but especially from before and particularly the Tibetans have such a different attitude to traumas, scars, stresses. They don't have neuroses. 
they just don't have neuroses. They just are taught from a very, very young age to just let everything be and that nothing is substantial and nothing is tangible. But we can't get it. For us, that trauma, that scar is tangible and permanent and with us, and we can't get rid of it in any way or any form. So I've taken something very, very interesting from Tai Situ Rinpoche in his book, Relative World, Ultimate Mind. And he explains what Tibetan life is like. Now, I'm not giving you a history on Tibetan life. I'm just saying to you, and you come back to me, challenge me if you want. But I'm saying to you, the way the kids grew up in Tibet was a way very, very, very attuned to a natural way of life. We grow up not attuned to a natural way of life. Now, it's very interesting because in the bush, we, we did a couple of a couple, you know, we had this, we had a couple of guides and we had people who took us in the bush. And what they would do, especially in the water camps, they would teach us very, very much how nature works. Now, what is amazing to me is that when you see what the termites do, how they how the termite mounds then become holes for various animals that are around and about, how this how the giraffes and the elephants eat from the top of the tree and the giraffes go, no, Jack. The giraffes go from tree to tree and they only, Jack, stop it. And they only, and they only eat the leaves a little bit on the leaf of one tree. And then they go to the next tree. And then they go to the tree after. And what happens is they, they take off the leaves, which changes the whole stuff of the whole tree, of the tree and its involvement. And it's such an amazing thing how that actually happens because, you know, they know, they work within nature. Now, when I looked at Taisitu's description, he said like this, he said, although physical imbalance is a serious condition, mental disharmony is a more serious affliction the same as the body you need to balance in your mind what is out what is out of balance perfect mental balance on a relative level involves equalizing desire anger ignorance jealousy and pride keep them in line so they're not out of control he said a major imbalance can lead to illness then the person's overwhelmed with confusion about what he or she perceives as reality. And the balance is maintaining clarity amid the confusion pervading human life. We have to heal the body and mind together. Now it gives us, I just realized what this poor animal is doing. I've got a white shirt and the, it's quite dark in the garden. And every time he sees the reflection of my hand, he thinks it's somebody coming. So most of our neuroses are really like that because we see things and we believe them and then we react to them in that way. Anyway, he said, just by living in a completely natural setting, a person goes through a gentle therapeutic process. He says when people are not exposed to the natural process of life and are isolated from a natural reality, he says, therapy becomes more necessary as a means to handle the stress in the new situation. He said, the early part of life is the most important for forming attitudes and responses. The process begins with conception and continues while a person is growing from a helpless newborn baby into an independent adult human being, roughly 20 years, okay? And it is deeply rooted in that per person's experience. He says, um, confusion and emotional or physical difficulties in the life of a pregnant woman will have an effect on the child she's carrying. Now I say this over and over and over to pregnant women because pregnant women think they can have a fight with their husband, they can say they don't really want this baby 
or they can say, let's terminate the pregnancy, or they can say whatever they like, or they can say, I hate you, because the baby's not around and the baby doesn't understand. But that consciousness is absorbing all of this. And even though if we go back, those imprints were in the, in the being before, which forced him to come to these parents, we, when we are having pregnancies, have to really realize that that baby, that consciousness, picks up everything we do. And a lot of the traumas, I have a lot of people that can remember the womb. I can't possibly remember the womb. But some people remember the womb and the anxiety their mother went through and everything else. So it's really important that we have this. And he says, where people live close to nature, they become aware of such factors without really trying. He says, when a woman is pregnant in Tibetan culture, in the early Tibetan culture, her condition is respected and people make efforts to minify, minimize her physical and mental stress. Now, I wonder how my kids' four pregnancies went through with me always counseling trauma of other people, whether, whether it left an effect on them or what it did. You know, I can remember sometimes being nine months pregnant and being, you know, at the school and counseling, you know, hundreds of people that were in real dire straits and things. And I wonder what kind of effect that has on the unborn baby. He said, but, and he said, after birth, the family structure and way of life support the child physically, emotionally, and mentally. He says, in their life, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins, in addition to the mother and father, take care of the child's needs. And this provides real stability. So if your mom hasn't got time with you, your aunt takes you and, you know, and or feeds you or whatever the case is. And he says, they live with nature and they know the trees, flowers and animals. The child sees his mother milking the cow to get the milk that he's going to drink for breakfast. And from the beginning, he learns about the natural order of things from nature itself. Such an interesting thing, not like the illusions we grow up. So he said, a common practice is for a parent to tell a child who does not want to eat their yogurt to please take three more spoonfuls for the sake of such and such a cow who gives the milk. And that way the child learns where yogurt comes from. So the child mother will say, or the auntie, have three more spoons because, you know, this is Daisy the cow's milk. And we milked it yesterday. And now you have to please Daisy the cow to actually eat three more spoonfuls of your yogurt. You just Think about this, ponder it, and see what a different environment is. It has such a deeper value and appreciation of the natural rhythm of how things develop. And also, he said that death, I won't go into all the things. Oh, he talked a lot about self-hate that we have. And he also talked about death, that children in Tibetan culture experience death firsthand. So if an animal's dying, the whole family is involved in the death of the animal. Same with an uncle, same with an aunt. And all the beautiful teachings about death are taught to the child in such a wonderful way. So you can actually understand fully that that gives the child, not the trauma that we have. We are told we are kept away from death. We often kept away from funerals. We often kept away from very sick people. And so we develop that neurosis and fear of death and dying. It's not a natural process in our whole lives. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff here and I won't go into any more. I just really wanted to give you an idea and maybe anybody wants to say something or comment on it because I think it's really important before we go into what are our neuroses, traumas, scared in our culture, what are they all about? But maybe somebody wants to comment or say or ask or tell, please tell me what you feel. Isn't it a very beautiful way of life to actually have this kind of natural order of things and an extended family and people taking care of you? You can understand that our 
our masters, our lamas. I mean, what they went through leaving Tibet and going to India was the most traumatic thing. They never talk about it unless you are asking a question. Now, you could think, what, do they repress it? No. As soon as it's over, they actually don't talk about it at all anymore, and it's done, and it's over. And I once told you, even with presents, um, when you give any of them presents, you know, we expect, if we've taken a whole lot of time to find a present, we expect people to say, thank you, and I really love it, and it's such a nice gift, and thank you very much for giving it to me. And they will say, when you give them the present, they will say, thank you very much, and you'll never hear a word. Sometimes I would go to some of the monks that I, you know, that I brought gifts for at Sherebling and say, did the shirt fit you? Then they'd go, yes, but you don't talk about it. There's no clinging to anything. There's definitely no clinging. There's no neuroses and there's no clinging to trauma. What do you think about this? Anyone want to say anything or ask anything? Anyone, please do, because I like to hear. Danny, don't be frightened to open your voice if you want to, please. Any of you, eager. Linda, Kerry, American Kerry, Kerry, who also deals in psychology, Mimi, Phyllis, anyone, Kathy. Do you want to say something, my sick little one? Hey? Anyone? I'll say something. Can you hear me? I think for me, listening to this, I'm thinking back on how I maybe didn't parent the right way, you know, and I mean, my daughter's 28 now, but I, wow. I think, you know, I did keep her away from sick people and maybe I wanted to protect her from dying people. And now yeah. I'm just, you know, everything you're saying just kind of goes against what I did, but I'm not going to beat myself up over that. But from this day forward, I will move on. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank wonderful. you for all of this. <laughs> it's wonderful because you know what? All of us did some crazy things with our kids and all of us, you know, didn't, we didn't have this kind of upbringing, but right. it really is true. You know, in, in, in Western culture, the D word, the death word, is not talked about. In right. culture, it's such a beautiful thing where, that you start learning about it already very early in your life. And when you really understand these death and dying teacher, teachings, which apply totally to life as well, it's the most wonderful thing and you're not afraid anymore. You're not afraid at all. And you watch these llamas go through death. But I'm just saying that it's a very interesting thing because um, children are protected a lot of times from all of these things. And we don't realize how neurotic they become. But of course, we can't change that. But with our grandchildren, we can kind of change it. Mimi, what did you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say about guilt. Now, they don't suffer from guilt. Is uh, this because of the belief in karma or just the natural way of things? I mean, how is that, incul you know, how do they inculcate that in them? No you guilt, see, no singing. You see, this is what, this is what Tai C to, and there's a lot of this stuff, and maybe we can go back and do some of it. He calls self-hatred, okay? So we are taught, we are brought up on guilt. You shouldn't have done this. I mean, our churches and synagogues, the synagogue's not as bad, I think, as the churches. But, you know, we brought up on shoulds and shouldn'ts and all these kind of things. So we always feel quite a lot of guilt, and the guilt becomes a hang-up. Now, what Kerry's saying, which I love, is she saying, wow, I brought my daughter up very differently, but and I can't do anything about it, but I sure can move on. And she sure can pass on to her daughter that it would be lovely when her daughter has her daughter or her daughter's already had her daughter or her children 
she can she can do a more natural she can do a more natural process with them but we don't have that with our nuclear family and all our guilt and all our everything but you see mum this is what i see to is saying don't make a neurotic fixation over guilt. I'm coming to you, Dan. Don't make a neurotic fixation over it. So that would have been a nice way. I didn't do it that way, but I can move on. Exactly what Kerry said now is absolutely amazing. And I did children not have it because they taught that way that there's a oh, karmic. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, you can teach them, we're going to do. Um, shamata and vipassana, looking deeply, and the foundational practices. We're going to talk about how they can actually heal all the neuroses, all the scars, all the traumas. And Rob Priest's work is so brilliant on this. And so is James Lowe. They're both psychologists, and they're both very deep Buddhists. And I think they really give us so much. I want to I want to define all the neuroses and then go on to how we move into another dimension. Now, Danny, where are you? You disappeared again. Uh, okay, what did you want to say? I was just going to say with the should and the should not. I mean, to a point, though, like you're saying with the pregnant woman, in a way, aren't they saying like, well, you shouldn't be anxious and that because everything you do is going to go to the baby. So in a way, that is a lot of like pressure that you can then turn to guilt and you can get attached to, okay, I mustn't do this and I have to be careful and watch everything I do while I'm pregnant. I wouldn't do that. What I would do is, which I'm going to teach you in these sessions, is to look at anxiety and guilt in a completely different way. So it's not that you're without, I think that if we ask every single pregnant woman how they how they felt when they're pregnant, it's absolutely impossible to have no anxiety, especially near the end, you know, or near the beginning, or when you've lost a couple of babies or whatever the case is. There's always going to be anxiety, but it is the Tibetan attitude towards anxiety which is really different to ours. And their attitude, we can't have their natural way of life because we live in cities and we've, we've got parents who were brought up by their parents and they had all this stuff, you know. But it's a very interesting thing that we can change our whole view towards guilt and trauma and anxiety and everything. We could change our whole view. And that, I mean... Fear, which is anxiety, is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. So all our anxiety, all our fear, when we actually can analyze it as false evidence appearing real, that means there is something there, but it's not what I think and have made it into. Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's really important, very important, this. And I think that this is where the lamas really teach us. They never hang on. So interesting, because many times, Lama Yeshi has told me something absolutely amazing, let's say, or traumatic, let's say. And when I've seen him again, I want to bring it up again. Because I want more information and I want to know about what happened. And he's got no desire. He'll impart it and then it's gone. We cannot do this. We've got like a fishing rod into every single thing that we do. We fish it up again. And when it goes into the water, we fish it up again and we fish it up again. We have to stop doing it and know that this is a temporary transient drama and we have to look at it completely differently and shamata and vipassana you see if you do shamata which is calm abiding and how you actually look at all these things that's fine but shamata is not going to give you the insight that vipassana is going to give you the insight of the meditation and so it's really important that we learn both and that we combine both which is what we're going to do here. Okay. 
Kerry, Kerry, my little Kerry from America, did you want to say something else? Because I saw you had something you wanted to say after I spoke. Not Kerry Hotel. I'm going to call her Kerry America. <laughs> did you want, hi, Kerry. Just unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Just unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. Great. I think I was just saying, uh, I was agreeing with what you were saying. Yeah. Great. So, no, no. Yeah. I'm going to give you lots and lots of techniques. And I think Rob Priest offers so many techniques. And then me with my experience and everything, I can add to that. But I think it is absolutely, uh, it is absolutely possible to get rid of, to not to get rid of, to allow these neuroses, because this is not about repressing them, which we'll talk about in a moment, because repressing them is not the answer. These llamas don't repress their scars and things. But let me say, so what are our neuroses, traumas, scars, stresses about? Firstly, Neuroses are those things made up by the mind from all the different conditions of our samsaric life. All the things that we become obsessed with and become stressed about, like relationships, breakups, not having enough money, fear of aging. I mean, I watch these people, you know, first of all, when we were in the bush, I had my, my granddaughter, who's 22, and I had my... Um, Sorry, so in a, I'll look at that now. I had my granddaughter and my daughter, and you know, so the auntie and the niece, but they're very much on a on the same wavelength. And many times when we were going on these long game drives, they were having discussions about social media and about also, you know, that I didn't know what they were talking about. Okay, I really didn't understand the conversation in any way. But what I did hear was that the way we look at things is so is so ego driven. OK, but the neuroses, the fear of aging, being the best in our ego driven work, having more power, phobias, habits, addictions, not only obvious addictions like alcohol and drugs and cigarettes, but sexual addictions. There is such a vast amount of people with sexual addictions, with shopping addictions. People have shopping addictions. Whenever they're anxious, they go out and buy something. And food, food disorders, overeating, undereating, anorexia, you know, all these things which come from neuroses. Usually when you'll see a bulimic, a bulimic child, they'll come from a controlling parent. So all of these things, but why have they got a controlling parent? That goes back to their own imprints. So therefore, once you're looking at this, you've got to look at it completely differently with a different view. So all the addictions, all the anxieties, the insecurities, the need for control, sleeplessness, involvement with social media, and the list goes on and on and on. Then there are the traumas, not the neuroses, but can become neurotic or even psychotic from your traumas. Individual traumas like abuse, rape, hijackings, crime, loss of parents, loss of siblings, long illnesses, you know, cancers, whatever you want to say. These are your individual traumas and then group traumas like wars, natural disasters, terrorism, holocausts, cults, all of those kind of things. You know, you just have to think in this war, uh, people say to me, if these hostages are, are released, just for example, and they're not the only traumatized beings in the world, but if these hostages are released, could they lead a normal life? Now, my answer, this is just my answer. You can dismiss it with greatest of pleasure. But my answer is, that psychology cannot help trauma like that, okay? It might give a little bit of time, you know, to, it might 
it might say alleviate a little bit of suffering on the way. But the only way you can survive that is with a spiritual view. If you think that that is real, if you think that that has happened to you and that you are guilty and that you are this and you are that, you could never survive without having complete stress and complete trauma. So the thing is that the only thing for me, because I saw what these llamas suffered when they, when they left Tibet, and the only thing that could help them was, the, was you know, having that view that this is a temporary transient life, and that everything happens to you for a particular reason, and it gets dissolved, and you don't cling on to it. But that is so difficult for us in the West. It's so difficult. And what I want to say is that we then develop storylines. We develop storylines about our life's experiences. And we live by these storylines to survive. Unless, of course, we find an alternative to this momentum, which can become totally habitual life after life. Now, for example, I've heard the masters teach about people who commit suicide. Many people who take their lives and commit suicide have done it many times before. And the thing is, it becomes a habit momentum. So as soon as they can't cope with life, they want to leave and commit suicide. And what they don't understand is, they're taking their mind with them into the suicide. So it's really important to understand that most of these traumas and most of these things are habitual things from life to life. However, however, what is so important to understand for everybody is that it is not useful. You know how Lama Yeshi goes, is this useful? Sorry, I'm going to look at your thing done. If it's not, it's not useful to take a person who, say, for instance, has had a terrible rape, okay, and teach them that they had the karmic imprint and that they've come into this life, they need to experience it, it's their own creation. It's not helpful, okay? Even a situation like hostages, it's not helpful to teach them that it's their imprints that might have put them into this situation because there's such guilt and such trauma and such anxiety about it that when you teach them about the habit momentum and their own imprints that they created long before, they are in a worse state. So what Rob Priest does is he changes the take responsibility for what has happened to you, he changes that to call it healing. Let's heal you. So he uses the Buddhist techniques of, for example, Vajrasattva for the person to purify their trauma rather than take responsibility for their trauma. You have to really be careful with this. Because you do not want to add to people's trauma. You want to help people using a Buddhist approach as to how they can use that trauma. You can ask me, I just want to see what done. So in a Western scenario, it's not about us raising our kids on a farm and reading them in the book of death when their baby is necessary. But looking at things in a new way and incorporating a sense of letting go exactly, precisely. Okay, that is what it is. Because we can't go and live on a farm and we can't say this is the yogurt. The, we could to children say this is the yogurt the cow gave. Let's, let's do it. But they can't see the cow that gave it. So exactly what you've said. And happiness is the inverse of expectations. And in the West, we have an idea of how things should be. So when it doesn't meet that idea, we cannot deal with it. Very good, very good thing. You see, this is where the view comes in, Dunny, because this is where when we start learning Buddhism, we do not use good and bad. We do not use 
happiness and sadness. It doesn't matter what it is. We allow it to occur and we allow it to happen. We're not looking only for happiness. In fact, Patro Rinpoche teaches the absolute opposite. He actually says, oh, when you get criticized, this is really good because then that deals with your ego. When you have trauma, this is really good because this clears and purifies all your imprints. He just has another attitude to it. So he says, don't be looking for happiness all the time. That's not going to bring you everything you need. Look for being the equanimity, the balance, the acceptance of what you've had to go through in your life. Because we have to realize that there are also obvious traumas, you know, traumas that you can see, individual and group karmas, and more obvious woundedness from abusive parents. But there's also a lot of not such obvious trauma and wounds and scars that people carry from, for example, disengaged families. Now, if you look in family therapy, that whole term of the disengaged family are families that are not abusive to their kids. They, their kids get everything. They get what they need in life, but there's no emotional connection. The parents are disconnected emotionally from the children. And the children grow up with a lot of woundedness and a lot of trauma. And Buddhism says, these are the imprints you created and you need to change that storyline in your life. You need to look at the triggers of your emotion. Why is it that I always get so upset if I'm talking to someone and they don't respond to me in the way I want. You learn. You don't have to get that response. You don't have to get that happiness in order to feel better. You just get the acceptance of what is happening in that situation. Do you all understand? So, like, they're also enmeshed families. And those are families where the mother and father do or well, the mother is over-involved with the kids and she does all their homework and she does everything for the kids. And that child grows up with the feeling of, I'm not adequate. I need somebody to do it. When I do my own homework, it's always wrong. So I need my mom to do my homework. And they grow up with hang-ups. I'm not adequate. I'm not good enough. But whatever traumas, wounds or scars or hang-ups are, they become the story line of our lives internally or externally. And when we do understand, we don't, with a very traumatized person, say, you created this. This is what you are paying in your karma. You don't even go into that because that's too, that's too guilt-ridden and threatening for that person. We have to say, yes, this has happened to you, we're going to teach you how to accept it and how to allow the trauma to be and how not to hang on to it for dear life, to move on without fixation. You all look very alarmed. Anyone want to say something? I'm doing so much talking, my voice is... Are you all okay? Because I'm going, I'm going, we're going to do a meditation soon. Okay. When we know that we create these imprints, then we really, really, really have to take responsibility for those imprints. But when it's a trauma, like say these hostages come out, and I think many of the young girls are going to be pregnant, they have gone through the most awful, awful trauma. You cannot use the imprints for them. It'll be too much. It'll be too traumatic. It'll be, but you can say, you know, there is a way to get past this. There is a shift from the ego, which I want to teach you about, to the Buddha nature. And if we keep remembering that the Buddha nature, our true nature, 
never gets affected by the traumas, the wounds, the scars, the stresses. It is totally unaffected by that. So isn't the idea to move from Sem, the ordinary human mind and the way it looks at everything, to Sem Ni, the nature of mind, which looks at everything from a completely, totally different viewpoint. And I really think, you know, that many people do different things. Some people repress that trauma, completely repress it, okay? And they their scars and their wounds. And what they hope to do is they hope to build a new life on top of that trauma. But because they haven't got the awareness, that repression keep surfacing in a different way and they're not aware of it. So even though they build a love, they haven't let it go. They've just repressed it, hoping to build on top of it. And that that's, you know, really, really, really can give that person a strong influence in all their hang-ups in life. Because even though they've built their life and they don't talk about it, I mean, lots of my parents' generation never spoke about their trauma. Lots of Holocaust people who survived never spoke about their trauma, never told their children. But they had masses of hang-ups. You know, they were always scared there wouldn't be enough food. They were always scared of all sorts of things. So that is not a way that we can... The repression causes a lot of weird hang-ups that they're not aware of. Now, on the other hand, some people want to talk and talk and talk and talk and debrief over their, their anxiety, okay? And they want to debrief over and over and over again in psychotherapy to friends and it becomes their life's, their life's theme, okay? What went through, they're always talking about it and they're always getting it up. And do they heal this way? Maybe a bit, but isn't this making the scars tangible, solid, and permanent? And that beautiful story of a man of learning came to the head monk to ask of the monastery, to ask about the nature of the monastery's teaching. He asked the head monk many questions, which were in fact statements of what the man believed the teachings were about. To all his statements, the head monk listened calmly, gently nodding his head and replying, yes, that is so. Yes, that is so. Finally, the man said, well, then you have nothing to teach me as I already know everything you have to teach. Oh, no, replied the monk. The teachings are nothing like what you believe them to be. Then why have you been agreeing with me all the time, demanded the man. The monk smiled kindly and replied, before you can feed the baby, you must stop it crying. <laughs> before you can feed the baby, you must stop it crying. <laughs> it's a very important story that because you really have to stop the baby from crying because he goes on and on and on. Intellectually, a lot of people will talk about the trauma, those that do use this technique, but it'll all be intellectual and about what they've done to help themselves. And it's more words, less heart. Like I find in therapy, I might have somebody in therapy and then they tell me all about what, what their problem is, their trauma, whatever it is that they have felt, they tell me about quite a lot about and everything. And then in the end, I say, okay, let's go there. And then we go into an inner meditation and we enter where that trauma actually happened. I'm, I'm just giving you one hypothetical example and we go there. Then when we go there, when we're really there, she stops talking quite a lot. And I'm going on being here and saying what I feel about the whole situation and everything. And then when we come out of that and she's crying and she's feeling it, 
When we come out of that and I ask, okay, how do you feel? No more words. Now, when there are no more words, it means it's hit right down here. It's no longer intellectual. It's now hit to the core of your heart. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to be talking, talking, talking about it. We want it to hit a core that is so important and that makes us do that change, that makes us want to go to a different view, which is so important. And some people might join with other people who've also been through similar experiences. And this would be good if they can move on or perhaps help others in that situation. Like often I see on TV, the human traffickers who've been through, who've been human trafficked, have you been through that? And then when they've escaped, they now devote their whole lives to helping others who've been in human trafficking and that kind of thing. That's a very, very good thing. Because I think that really, that really does help if the person can move on. But it's dependent on the person. It really, really is. So what's very important is all these methods have some pros, many cons, but Buddhism has an entirely different approach, moving from the relative into the ultimate, which we've seen so many of our Tibetan masters. You know, you have to ask them about that trip to Tibet. I mean, you know, with Akong Rinpoche and Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, there were 300 of them that left. They were starving, and only, I think, what, 17 of them or something arrived in India at the end of that trauma. They went through the most unbelievable thing. They never talk about it unless you actually ask them. They'll tell you about it. They're not interested in any way in holding on to it. It's gone. It's done. Whatever happened, happened. They'll only use it to teach people from it. It's very interesting because I always wonder how they did. Okay, but just to say this, then I'll throw it open and then we'll do the first meditation. To deal with all the neuroses, fixations, traumas, etc., we need to surrender ego's dominance. So important. We need to surrender ego's dominance. Now, what happens if you've been brought up in a family? you know, where ego is the most important thing and you really are traumatized with everything and you're always told, you do what you need to do. You, you be this, you push this, you control this, you be the best at this. How do you deal with it? It's really important because the ego needs to control everything in order to feel safe. And this is very difficult for many of us because our whole orientation in the West of believing our lives are about ego, I, me, myself, and mine, and the five skandhas that the Buddha taught, when ego feels it's losing control, it tries to grasp at anything that will patch up the cracks. So the five skandhas is what ego is made of, which we, we study, form the physical form. I mean, I've seen people who are so neurotic about their physical form. I mean, I, I hear from a lot of the young girls that when they're in their 20s, they're already having Botox for, for potential wrinkles and things. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not criticizing. I'm not evaluating. I'm just saying if already in your 20s you are worried because there are a couple of crinkles in your eyes or your lips or whichever parts, then have you ever surrendered? The form becomes the most important thing. The gyms are much fuller than the spiritual discourses, I can tell you. The gyms are very full because form becomes most important. Feelings. We think they're tangible. We think they're real. We think they're ours. We think they're... We can't get rid of them in any way. So form, feelings, perceptions, the way we see things, that's part of ego's role. So we see things the way we've been brought up and the way we've conditioned ourselves in the habitual momentum. 
And then the perception becomes a habit momentum, which comes with you from life to life to life to life. And the habit momentum then becomes our consciousness. And that's what we believe. And it's unbelievable to me when I hear people and what they believe and what they see and what they hear, it's all based on ego and the need for control. Very difficult to go to another level if you really believe in that. Anyone want to say anything? Because we'll do a little meditation because I want to move into the real higher way of looking at it in Buddhism. But I want to clear a lot of these points of from the dominion of the ego to a more profound wisdom. Such an interesting thing. When you go from the dominion of the ego to a very profound wisdom, just think about it. Look at the five wisdoms. Each of them are, are attached to one of the skandhas. Now, the skanda that is the habitual momentum is the wisdom of perfected action. Now, the only way you can carry the wisdom of perfection through you is by surrendering that ego, allowing that wisdom of perfection to move through you. As soon as the wisdom of perfected action moves through you, the habit momentum fades completely and totally. Because the habit momentum pulls you there. The wisdom of perfect, perfected action shows you the beautiful wisdom that it really is. And the habits just dissolve. In each of those things, the wisdom of equality really is attached to the feelings, the sensations. The minute you understand the wisdom of equality, all these feelings we attach to just dissolve into into absolute space. Each of the skandhas is it's so fascinating to see the perfect the perception. The perception is associated with the lotus family, the wisdom, discriminating wisdom, the wisdom that discerns. As soon as you've got discerning wisdom, your human perception just dissolves. And when you play with these and you understand them, it's the most fascinating thing. Really, really it is. So we need to deal directly with these neuroses, wounds, as these are our confused understanding of who we are. It is not who we are. You do not know how many people say to me, Melanie, this is who I am. And I go, no, this is who you purport to be. This is who your habit has told you you are. This is just your temporary drama of this lifetime. You've been millions of things in other lifetimes. So this is not your nature. This is just the nature you perceive yourself to be. When you understand that, okay, we directly deal with those neuroses and wounds as these are our confused understanding of who we are and who the world is. We can't see our true natures with all their natural spontaneous qualities that arise as soon as we connect with that Buddha nature, which is what we're trying to do over all these sessions. We believe in the solidity of our confused ideas and try to make ourselves feel better, feel safer, and try and control our world. But actually, actually, which is so interesting in Taisitu's teaching, he says, the more vivid and the greater the difficulties you are facing in your life, the greater the opportunity to connect with the new experience of ultimate truth, the more energy. So just think of it. The harder your life is, the more difficult your life is, the harder it is to live with it, the more painful it is, the more you are cleaning, the more energy there is to really devote to the most beautiful life. Think about that.
I can see you all concentrating and it's hard. But we see the neurotic fixations in their fullest, rawest, raw, not R-O-A-R, R-A-W, their raw condition, fundamental state. Then we connecting with basic energy. Now, Rob Priest takes this and then he shows you in the Buddhist practices how the energy winds move. The energy winds carry our traumas, carry our neuroses, carry our scars, carry our stresses. So as soon as you work with the energy of the, of the, the, the actual plain raw energy, the more those things will go away. That's interesting. For example, when I did, when I started doing prostrations, now, you know, Lamayeshi has told me a lot of times, he said to me, Melanie, prostate prostrations are the most amazing way of dealing with your energy winds. Now, your energy winds carry everything of, of what you are. The wind is what makes it move. I was looking at this book on Padma Sambhava's five energy and the wind is what makes things move, what makes things happen, the energy of the wind in its pure form. Now, when you do prostrations and you do the prayers of the body, speech and mind as you're doing the prostrations, now, without ever knowing, because nobody taught me this and Rob Priest said, we should be taught this before we actually do them because then we would know what was happening in our psychology. But of course, the Buddhist teachings didn't really, they, they do it, but they didn't really take account to explain to you what was happening. Now, when I started to do prostrations and I did them on retreat in the first instance, I was doing the prostrations and I could actually feel muck coming out of my body I could actually feel it and I felt angry I felt um I felt really what can I say I felt I felt irritable I felt fairly anxious I felt angry but I remember thinking stuff is coming out of your pores Melanie I remember thinking that but no one explained it to me now, Rob Priest takes this and explains it to you because Lama Yeshi said to me, the prostrations are the best exercise you could ever, ever do. He said, because what they do in the prostrations is they move the energy winds in which all the trauma and stress is there. So when you do them over quite a period of time and you do a lot and you stretch out in full, things start happening in your body, but they don't explain to you in terms of psychology. So we don't know. We just think, well, they tell us this is good and it's a way of taking refuge and it's a way of doing things. It's a way of starting that clearing of all the imprints. It's amazing, really amazing. I'll come to deal with that, but I just want you to understand this a little bit, to connect with the basic energy because Keith, uh, Keith Diamond, oh, Priest is P-R-E-E-C-E, -E -E. Priest, Rob Priest. I'll give you his thing. I think it's um, something like the psychology of Tantra. I'll give you the name of the book just now. Okay. But we have to break through the self-destructive, masochistic, painful, sad, sorrowful conditioning into the ground of being from which everything emanates. And Keith Dowman says, as long as we see ourselves when we are identifying with the little me, as tiny islands surrounded by a threatening shark-filled ocean, we are trapped. Can I read that sentence again? As soon as as long as we see ourselves when we identify with the little Melanie as tiny islands surrounded by a threatening shark-filled ocean, 
We are trapped because it means, listen, here I am. This is me. Everybody around here is giving me a hard time. I don't feel safe. I don't feel controlled. As long as you're feeling that, you're nowhere in your Buddha nature. And he says, can we be insecure without doing anything about it? My answer to that is, no, most people can't. If they're insecure, they will either do one of their actions, they will do one of their, they will do one of their neuroses, they will do, they will go out and make a plan, they will, they will make a plan, they will never do nothing about their insecurity. But what if you discovered your insecurity was really no thing, nothing, just a pandering to the dominance of ego. Think about that, okay? Because he says, can we decide not to attach to the relative truth of our lives and see the picture of the ultimate while allowing the relative to play out? So you're uncomfortable, you could be unhappy, you could be bereft, you could have a scar. You could have stress. Can you just let it be? No, we can't. Most of us can't. But that's the whole thing. And this is where we turn to Buddhist practice to teach us to do this. Alone, it's almost impossible. So Rob Priest said he really, really, really realized that so many people could not could so many Westerners could not do what was there because they couldn't do what was there because they were so threatened and they didn't understand what their psychology was about. And he said, I would really like to have had an explanation on where my psychology was even before I started practicing. So that's what I'm kind of giving you right now. It's really important because this can't be done intellectually. It's got to be done experientially. And that's why I find when I'm not just talking to people, but I'm doing a meditation with them, which we're going to do right now. But when I'm doing a meditation with them, I'm talking about on a one-on-one -on -one basis. They are really, really, really getting to where they are, feeling it, and just allowing it to be. That's the answer. It's really, really the answer. And what I want to talk about next time, it won't probably be next week, it depends if he's going to let us do, if he's going to do this lecture on Zoom, but looking for the triggers. What is it that triggers me? That can only come from Vipassana, looking deeply. What is it that triggers me? What happens? Why, when I'm feeling anxious, do I start tidying things? Why do I go shopping for things when I feel low? What makes me drink more alcohol when I'm out with people? Why, why do I start organizing and tidying things when I feel uncertain? Why do I hoard and hold on to things? Why do I always resort to self-loathing when I'm not sure? How come I said yes when I didn't want to do it? All these triggers. So you have to learn what sets me off and what lies behind and deeper of the pattern that sets me off. And when you do some of the practices, you really get to understand them. So let's do some Vipassana. I'm not Vipassana. Let's just do some Shamata tonight. And then next time, we will do the Vipassana looking into the triggers. What is it that I'm seeing? And not being afraid. And never being 
self-condemning or self-loathing or self-hating because of what you did. Forget it. It's already done. As, as American Kerry said, move on, move on. I didn't do this or I did this and I really didn't. I made quite a mistake and everything, but I really, really, really need to move on. Let's do the, the shamata for starters. Okay. Now, when you sit in a meditative posture, I know some of you are sitting on a chair or a desk, but if you're on your bed, always put try and put a cushion under your bum so that your bum is higher than your, your legs. Then your, your, your knees can go right down into a real, real flatter position behind you, okay? So one of the most important things is to sit with your back in a straight upright position in the beginning. Later, you don't have to if it doesn't suit you. But the reason you do that is for those energy winds because the energy winds run through the proper energy winds when they are primordial wisdom. They run through the central channel. On the left-hand side of woman, you have those... Um, those negative energies. On the right-hand channel of woman, men the opposite. On the right-hand channel of woman, you have a, not the primordial wisdom, but you have a, a wisdom channel that can reason about things where the energy runs. But what you want to do is you want to bring the energy wind into the central channel, which automatically puts you into equanimity. That's why when you start meditating, it's really good to have your posture in an upright position and your breath moving, moving slowly and carefully through you because then you can get that energy and your chin slightly tucked in and your hands right over left with the thumbs touching on your lap and your shoulders back and your eyes decidedly open. It's okay to have them half open if you prefer, but definitely not closed because you don't want to zone out. You want to zone in. And in that position, you are breathing in to the count of three or four through your nostrils, out to the count of three or four through your mouth. And in and out. And you're checking where you're carrying the tension specifically for this work on the neuroses and the fixations and the stresses. It's really important that you see physically where you are carrying your tense energy. So check your neck, your forehead, your hands your legs, your feet, your mouth, check your ears, check where you're carrying the energy and just roll the breath through all those tense parts of your body, breathing in to the count of three or four, taking in the spaciousness of the sky and out to the count of three or four, not letting go, but letting be. Letting go means there was something tangible to let go of. Letting be means anything and everything. Just let it be as you give your out breath. Pour it into the spaciousness of your true nature in the breath. And the most important thing of your shamata is to develop awareness of what your mind is doing. So here tonight, if you can automatically think of one or two of your stresses or one or two of your strains or your traumas, just let them be. 
and watch. Watch what the man does. The man goes straight and picks them up. The split second you notice that, that is where you take your mind back into the body, into the breath. If you don't like using breathing, it's okay to use anything. You can use a pebble and focus on that in the beginning. You can use a stick, you can use a Buddha, you can use anything. But I think the breath works very well because then we can do some of Rob Priest's energy stuff when we get to that part. So you're breathing in and out relaxing your physical body and letting everything be, all your fears, your exaggeration, breathes. Absolutely everything gets breathed out. And in again, you breathe in a beautiful, spacious mind, the blue sky that can accommodate Breathe it in and breathe out, allowing it to go back into the space. And you train yourself to watch exactly what that mind does. If somebody walks into the room and your mind goes straight there, or there's a noise, or there's something that disturbs you, and your mind goes straight there, you notice it. And bring it back to the breath. This training is essential before you can do the Vipassana. Where we're looking for the triggers. Where we're looking for what created the neuroses. It's really important that you have full awareness of what your mind is doing. And where it is going. When you've got that. If I were you, I would practice this for at least three to five minutes. You don't have to do longer. Just do it a lot of times in the day while you're working. Just stop, take three minutes and do your shamatha. And bring your mind back to the present. The past is gone. All the traumas are gone. The future hasn't been made. And all we have is this moment. And the most important thing in this moment is your awareness. You want to be aware. You see yourself in this incarnation, a teeny wee pattern of thousands of patterns over thousands of incarnations, different incarnations, habit momentums, scars, stresses, little dramas that we play. And then James Lowe will teach us how to get out of the temporary drama of your life and into one of the deities, your own special qualities. We are moving when we go into Vipassana away from that threatened little ego-dominating self into space, full of possibility. And the Buddha nature permeates each of these things. So we practice this. Next time we come, we will do the Vipassana, the deep looking into, so you become aware of what triggers you Every time, your obsessions, your fears, what triggers you. Sometimes if you've got a phobia about an insect or a something, you will just see that insect, you will see a ball of cotton as that big spider, because that's how our minds work. So you've got to look very deeply to see your perceptions, to see your skandhas, to see how you operate. But first, you need to stabilize your mind. And 
you do it by this, nothing else. Just to stabilize the mind completely. Practice that, and then uh, we will go on. I want to, because that is your equanimity. I just want to tell you what Tai C2 says. He says he talks about developing equanimity. And what's equanimity? This is the definition. Notice what happens without getting into the dramatics, the grasping, the expanding, the analyzing, the judging. The facts are neither good nor bad. That is equanimity. Do you hear me done? Because you were the one that said when you're looking for happiness. He said, just see, notice what happens without getting into the dramatics, the grasping, expanding, analyzing, and judging. So let's end there. I must just tell you as we end that what happened to us was when we were in the bush, this huge python came out of the bush and was lying very near our car, okay? So the python came, so the ranger drove up and we're watching this python and it's moving nearer and nearer and nearer the truck, okay? So my daughter shouts out, I think that's near enough, okay? And at that moment, the python goes into the engine of the truck, it goes under the truck. This huge python went under and stayed there. Now we've got this hysterical video of the, 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 the ranger pulling the tail and my husband, the hero, went and he helped him to pull this huge python. He wouldn't let go, he was under the engine and everything. So we've got the whole video which then went on to my granddaughter, put it on to TikTok for the range. It had about 80,000 views or something within two days or something like that. But you just look at this, a snake, a python, that crawls under your car and doesn't want to get out, you know. And you should hear the comments that people made in the TikTok. I mean, it was hysterical. Some people said, you know, why my husband then, as it was coming out, he left the python and the and the ranger pulled this whole python out and he was on the ground. So someone wrote, why did the white man leave the tail and go off, leave it for the black man to pull out? I mean, you just look at people's perceptions. He was just pulling it out the tail, you know, how brave he was, because I wouldn't do that. And, you know, why did he leave? The comments, you know, people's perceptions. And when you, you can laugh about it, because that's the perceptions of our neuroses too. It's really important to understand that. So let's close, because it is late. I'm sorry, everybody. There's so much to teach you on this. Let's dedicate this, and I'll stay for a minute or two afterwards, through this merit, may we all achieve this all-seeing Buddha nature, I'm going to say. And thereafter, once the harmful enemies have been defeated, not that they ever were tangible to be defeated, once they are known, once they are identified with, once you can look deeply into the triggers, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, none of which are really real. Sonam die tamche zipane topne nepe dranam tamche ne jega na ji banak dropaye sipe sole doa dro war show.